up here in Southern Illinois showing cattle, and so we went to the county fairs and everything throughout the summer, and the state fair was kind of the culmination of going and showing your cattle for the year. And so in a few years ago, the book club that I'm part of, we actually read Devil in the White City, and I immediately thought of that when um, Miss Gully and uh, Mr. Jones asked me if I would do this here at the library. I'm like, oh, well, that would be perfect because it has to deal with the fair. It's the World's Fair. <laughs> that ties into the state fair. That would be wonderful. And then reading this book, it is, for the record, I'm not a nonfiction person. <laughs> I'm usually like sci-fi, fantasy style. So when I first read this book, I was like, oh, this isn't going to be for me. I don't think I'll like this. But Larson's ability to craft something nonfiction that reads like a thriller, like a fictional story is just masterful to me, and I absolutely love it. So there's a lot going on in this book. If you all have read it this month, you all know that. And so um, there's so much to talk about, too. And so it was kind of hard to narrow down what do I talk about, what do we focus on. So I've got it kind of organized. It's not going to go back and forth like the book does between Holmes and Burnham, but it's going to instead kind of focus on one part, the World's Fair, and then Holmes' part as well. So that um, just talking briefly about Larson, the author, um, he's only authored eight books, which I find interesting because I really enjoy his writing. Six of them, though, being New York Times bestsellers. Um, Obviously, you can tell from the work that he's done with journals and magazines that type of writing that he has kind of lends to that. It reads more like report writing at times, but I really like that he has kind of a, a list of different magazines and papers he's worked for, and then as a nonfiction writer, his background as an instructor of it kind of shows through in his writing. But the thing I really like about this book, like I said, is that it reads like fiction. The stuff that he's done, everything that's quoted in the book, every piece of dialogue is taken from a police report, from an eyewitness account, from any type of writing. So none of that is fabricated in any way. And then the other research that he's done is all kind of woven in there. So looking at the appendices in this book, it is pretty extensive just how much he's had to go through. And what I like is I researched a couple of other different resources in preparation for this, and all of them reference his book. They are all like, oh, go back to Devil in the White City to find out more. And so when the actual source material is referencing his work, it's it reminded me a lot of James Cameron when he created Titanic, and that he actually dove down to see Titanic and did all this research to make that film as accurate as possible. And so that reminded me of the same thing, him doing all of this research to make this book kind of the end-all, be-all account of the World's Fair, and in the case with H.H. H. Holmes. So I really appreciate that about him, but getting to the actual story itself, The Devil in the White City, the tale of one city, two men, and many, many murders, which you all <laughs> probably know from this book, just how insane it was. But the World's Fair, starting this book, I didn't realize exactly what was at stake and what was at odds with the construction of this entire event. So thinking about it in historical context, the fact that this wasn't even 30 years after the Civil War, it wasn't even 20 years after the Chicago World's Fire that had destroyed most of the city, and in the span of this time, Burnham decided, yeah, we'll just host this extravagant end-all, be-all fair in this city that's had so much up against it the last 10, 20 years, and the fact that it actually worked is astonishing to me. So. I was talking to Crystal right before this, and I will admit that starting this book, the first couple of, the first chapter or two, it takes a little bit to get into the story. I don't know if any of you all felt the same way, is that they almost kind of overload you with Olmstead and kind of all this information about the fair from the start. And for me, like I like crime and thrillers, like I watched last month's uh, book review, and I was like, oh yeah, that book sounds amazing. <laughs> and um, so when you get to the Holmes part, I was instantly drawn to it. But what I like is that the historical aspect just how much was against Burnham to get this whole thing put together and how it all came together in the end is just really astonishing. So the idea, I think it's also fitting to discuss this right before 4th of July in the sense of patriotism and how much was just at stake for not only Chicago but for the country as a whole putting on this fair because it was coming right off the tails of France doing their exposition, the Eiffel Tower had debuted, and Burnham saying, no, we need to kind of counter that and do something better and grander to kind of push America over the envelope in terms of that. So I liked in, uh, on page 16 of the book, I had to point out, and I'm kind of like a book, book purist. I know you had a lot of uh, notes and all this <laughs> stuff in your book. I'm like the one that never writes in the book, never touches it. Like the fact that this is coming apart because I've read it so many times, I'm like trying to put it all back together. But on page 16, I absolutely love the dialogue about when they were picking the city of choice and it was narrowed down to DC, 
New York, Chicago, and then St. Louis. The little nod that they give, just a wink for pluck to St. Louis. Like, you, it's nice that you want to put yourself in there, but <laughs> we're not going to pick you in the end. So it's kind of like a little nod of, of their thoughts on St. Louis at the time. That I really liked it. But one thing that I really admire about this book is the idea of the symbolism of the white city in the midst of the black city. So, you know, going, if you're not a history buff or someone that doesn't research history a lot, thinking of Chicago now, you know, you think of it being more sophisticated with Michigan Avenue and the shops and the South Loop and it being all very posh and everything. But looking at it in the late 1800s and thinking of it kind of like if you've read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, just seeing how dirty the city was. It was just mud and just filth and just stockyards and livestock. And it wasn't viewed as, you know, the prestigious, one of the biggest cities in the country now is very interesting. The idea that they managed to make this magical place in the midst of all that is really, really interesting to me. So talking about the industrialization, the idea that I, there's so much in this book in terms of what came from the World's Fair that we view now. So the idea fascinates me that Columbus Day comes from the World's Fair. The idea that this whole World's Exposition, we call it the World's Fair, but it was the Columbian Exposition to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus and that they didn't quite make the opening, it had to be one year later, 1893 instead of 1892 but that they were trying and that the national holiday came from this fair is just, that was the first thing right off the bat that I thought, oh, okay, well this is, and then from there it's just, there'll be lists later on of all the things that came from it. But just the sheer scale of, and this picture here just kind of shows the midway and the viewing of all these buildings, the scale of how much this cost <laughs> to create um, in doing research on it and from the book that Burnham was able to somehow get $22 million in 1893 to build this World's Fair, which today would be $600 million to do, which is incredible. And what's more incredible is the fact that it turned a profit. So the fact that this is one of the only major fairs in US history to turn in the black and make a profit out of it. And based on what it costs, because we think of how much it costs to go to a fair now and ride rides and get food and drink, the cost of a ticket in 1893 was 50 cents. So it was 50 cents for adults, it was 25 cents for children 12 and under, and admission was free for children six and under. So <laughs> to take a $22 million project, they turned a profit at the end of everything based on the 50 cent, 25 cent tickets of $446,832, mm -hmm. which today is 13.4 million. So the fact that they made $613 million off of the spare in a two-year run and somehow made a profit out of that is just off a 50 cent ticket is <laughs> incredible. I don't know if we could see something like that today. I don't know if we have an event that rivals that term of admission and attendance. Because they said there was over 27 million people that participated and came to the fair over its run, which is astounding. So that leads us to the people that constructed it. And uh, it's funny when you see actual photos of these people because in the book you get a certain idea of what they look like and especially the way they describe Holmes and describe Burnham and then you look back on 1893 fashion <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay, no, they all have mustaches, it's fine. <laughs> so um, Burnham's up there in the top corner there and then in the bottom picture there is him and um, John Root, which was his best friend at the time. And I really like their relationship in the book. I think for being a historical nonfiction, they really do a good job of portraying Burnham's kind of train of thought, what he's thinking about, the relationships he had with the architects involved. And it's really sad, I think, that I'm going to try not to spoil too much of those of you if they're watching that haven't read the book, but, um, but Root's death having a giant impact on Burnham, especially early on in the project. I thought that was really interesting because, you know, it, it was the first uphill battle was him losing his partner in the firm and having to go past that. But another thing I really appreciated about this book was just understanding architecture in the 1890s and also the ages of these architects because Burnham was 35, I believe, when he, during this project, so he's a few years older than me. So I'm like, you were in charge of a $600 million project and, you know, nothing, no pressure, <laughs> nothing to worry about. <laughs> um, just make this World's Fair that's supposed to be an icon of American history, it's fine. <laughs> You're just 35, it's okay. I think Root was in his 40s, but most of the architects, with the exception of Olmsted, were in their 30s and 40s doing this World's Fair and doing these projects, which is insane to me. That you think, when I think of architecture and architects, I think of people in their 50s, 60s, 70s that have all this experience creating these buildings and these wonderful pieces of architecture. And these guys were just, they've been in the business maybe five or 10 years, 
and were creating these masterpieces that were going to become iconic in American history. So I really like that, the idea of this new generation of architects, with the exception of Olmsted, who kind of was the, the anchor of being like, I'm the guy with the prestige, I'll keep everybody in line during this project. And it's really sad because a lot of these architects, when you research what happened after the World's Fair, a lot of them died young. Olmsted died in 1903, which was 10 years after the World's Fair. So, and then when we get to George Ferris, he didn't live long after the World's Fair either. So it's almost like some people talk about like the curse of big events and stuff, and it's kind of related to that, yes. But uh, one thing I really loved is that in the book here, when Burnham writes in his journal, the idea of the quote he says, make no little plans, they have no magic to stir men's blood. I love that quotation. It's one of my favorites in the book. The idea of we're gonna go big or we're gonna go home. Like we're not gonna <laughs> we're not gonna just do this project small. We're gonna make sure it's big and it's noticeable by the world. So really appreciate that. These are the other architects involved with each of the buildings. So Adler and Sullivan did the transportation building. Charles Atwood, he did several buildings, the forestry and anthropology, and he's kind of in the upper corner there. He's the, the dapper man with the, the cut hair there. Uh, Salon Bergman, Henry von Brunt, Henry Cobb, uh, Sophia Hayden, our only female architect, which she's listed there, and then um, Jenny and Mundy, Richard Morris Hunt, Charles McKim, uh, Robert Peabody, who's in the corner, the bottom corner, and George Post, and all the buildings in the World's Fair that they did. So one thing I really appreciated in the story was them going into detail about Sophia Hayden, because I don't know what you all thought, but I thought her part of the story was very um, sad. I didn't know she, First of all, she was hired. I like that they had to have a contest of female architects to decide who was going to be the one to do the women's building. Like these other guys had clout and prestige and had built themselves up, but they were like, we need to have a contest <laughs> so to find which female architect can do it. And Hayden won, um, receiving $1,000 for her design, which seems like a lot, and then you compare it to the 10000 that her male counterparts got in comparison. So, which you also have to think this is 30 years before women's right to vote, women's suffrage, so it's like, okay. Um, but I found her story to be really sad in this, that she had a vision and they picked her vision to be the women's building. And then as time went on and as construction went on, she just wasn't cooperating the way that the committees wanted her to and that they weren't appreciating her vision for the building. And it's one of those scenarios where, well, you picked her and this was her building design, but they ended up not liking it. And so Bertha Palmer coming in and taking over her right to build that building. And then on the one hand, we got brownies out of it because Bertha Palmer invented the brownie and debuted it at the World's Exposition. So that's great. <laughs> but in hindsight, I felt bad for Hayden because she sort of quit architecture after this and never pursued it anymore. It affected her that negatively. And so I do appreciate that several of the architects on this slideshow here did defend her and did come to her aid so that when she showed up at the inauguration, which was a bold move, when your building's been taken from you and given off to someone else and you show up at inauguration standing there like, nope, here I am, this is, I won this right, so, and the other architects supported her. I thought that was really impressive that they at least stood by her despite her getting fired from, this, from the design. Um, the other thing that was interesting is just the construction of these buildings. So the fact that it was just drywall and plaster and putting it up because um, one of my favorite parts of the book in the first part is when Olmsted and then go to Jackson Park and see the 630 acres of nothing <laughs> that is there and then saying, okay, we have a year to take nothing, 630 acres of it and make it the World's Fair. And so how are we going to do this in a year? And thinking of how construction was 100 years ago versus now, there's no automated machinery, there's no power <laughs> equipment to use, it's 20,000 men coming in with nails and hammers and beams and saying, let's just build this from the ground up is incredible. But the idea that they kind of shaped construction as well and how they did plaster and drywall and put this together. And then of course, painting it all in fine lead-based white paint. <laughs> and I'm sure it was incredibly toxic <laughs> that we don't think about today. They're like, oh yeah, that was probably not good for anyone's health. But I love that the idea of making it all white, the entire white city, because when you think of a big exposition like this, you think, oh, well, it's going to be colorful, and there's going to be all this, and they were leading that to the horticulture and the plants to kind of contrast that, but they wanted it all to be white, and I like that to contrast the dark city, the mud and the darkness of Chicago with this kind of beacon that people would go to. So I found that really interesting. Um, as far as dimensions, 630 acres in Chicago's Jackson Park uh, in the Midway, over 65,000 exhibits there over the course of its fair. 
50,000 of those were transferred into the Field Columbus Museum, which we now know as the Field Museum in Chicago, which I thought was interesting. And then just some buildings, some pictures, because I, the one thing I wish this book had more of were photos of the actual World's Fair, because we get a few of them in the parts separations, but I wish we had more images, because just seeing the scale of these buildings they constructed. So the one building, the administration building, being there on the far left, uh, the upper building there being the horticulture building, and you can see the, the Illinois building in the back, and then uh, the giant building there being the liberal arts building, and then them having a canal of Venice, having actual little um, replication of the Venice um, canal there is really, really interesting. But I wish we had more of those photos in this to just show the scale of it and just how impressive it was that they built this in a year and it managed, despite a fire, despite a storm, it managed to stay up for visitors to go into and, and no one vandalized it extremely, no one tore it down, it was just, it managed to stay up. And I felt very conflicted at the end when they said, we'll just burn it down. I was like, oh, I was like, you built this whole city and you're going to just burn it down. It's, it's, it was very sad reading that because I was like, oh, you can't just contain it or make it an exhibit, a permanent fixture, and it wasn't designed for that. But um, the crowds with the administration building, those were all the people that were there for Chicago Day, which I thought was really wonderful in the book. But that was their push to get people to come out for Chicago Day and people lined the streets there. But uh, this is probably the biggest spoiler of the book, but every time I read this book, I've read it a few times now, and every time it leads up to George Ferris, I just get really excited. So you know it's coming, and you know the book's hinting at it, and you're like, oh, we know who it is. Just go ahead and say his name. And then when they finally say his name, you're like, okay, yep, we all knew it was here. But I, I love the part about George Ferris. And I really liked finding this picture to scale the Navy Pier Ferris wheel versus the Ferris wheel that was in the World's Fair. So just for size comparison, the Navy Pier first was 150 feet tall, and this was 250 feet. So it was 100 feet taller. And the way that Larson writes the section about the Ferris wheel and the construction of it, and just how delicate it seems and fragile, and putting actual trolley cars as the cars on the Ferris wheel, that it's trolley cars that can fit 60 people each, so you have 2,000 people on this Ferris wheel in these ton heavy trolley cars on this thin, like you can see how fragile it looks, just the spokes and everything in it. And that first ride where, where George sent his wife up into it, she's like, I'll go. <laughs> I'm like, I, he didn't go. And I was like, you send your wife up there, great. And I love that part in the book where it describes the first trip up there and bolts just start raining down on everyone. Bolts just falling off the ride. <laughs> I'm like, and you had to go for two whole rotations. You couldn't just stop at one. It had to go two whole rounds. So the fact that they had to stay on there with bolts showering down on them. <laughs> so they were like, well, I hope that these cars don't fall. And the fact that it didn't, it's amazing to me that, that they didn't have a mad, major accident in this car, other than there were people that tried to jump out because they were so freaked out on it first. <laughs> and then they're like, we need to install bars <laughs> to keep people from trying to jump off this Ferris wheel. But just, I absolutely love it. And I love that the whole time leading up to it, you could tell Burnham in the book was getting more and more concerned because this was going to be what rivaled the Eiffel Tower. This was going to be the main attraction. And it not being done on time, and him being like, when's it going to get done? <laughs> and Ferris being like, don't worry about it. It'll get done. And then just the lead up to that was wonderful. But yeah, you can see in this second picture just the trolley cars and how they're attached there. And just, I can't imagine that view of the park up at the top of there and just how, if you're afraid of heights, I don't think anybody would possibly get on it <laughs> nowadays. But um, I do like the cost comparison here. So the cost of it was $400,000 in 1893 to build, which is about $12 million to build the Ferris wheel. And in profits, they made over $21 million today in profits off the Ferris wheel. So I thought that was incredible that, um, Ferris, his whole company that he made turned a profit and it put him on the map, but then unfortunately he died in 1896, three years after the World's Fair. So it's it's very Shakespearean in his tragedy because he's only 37. So imagine the idea that this guy that's my age that constructed this Ferris wheel and then unfortunately three years later passed and he got to see it in its total completion and success, but then wasn't able to do anything after that is quite sad. But I, I would say that that's probably one of my favorite storylines in the book is just Ferris and leading up to it and his whole um, creation of that project. But <laughs> uh, the other part that I really enjoyed, and this is probably me being a farm girl and everything, was Buffalo Bill because that was growing up. 
hearing stories about the whole Bill's Wild West show. I, his story is just so fun. I absolutely love that in this book. I don't know if you all, um, if that was a part that you all really enjoyed, but the idea of Buffalo Bill coming off his tour of Europe and saying, oh, this is a chance for me to make some money. This is the World's Fair. I'm going to come here. This will be perfect. And then him showing up, uh, sending Nate Salisbury, his manager, to go to Chicago and, and deal. And then the committee saying, well, and it's funny to know in context because we as the audience reading the book know at this point in the novel that Burnham is panicking. The fair is not generating. Uh, it's being more costly than it originally had seemed to be. He, they're worried about attendance. They're worried about it being completed. And so they're trying to get as much money as possible to make sure that the fair will be successful. And so when Salisbury shows up and they're like, oh, yeah, we'll have Buffalo Bill come in. Uh, we'll just take 50% of your profits and everything. <laughs> so he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'll go back and tell Buffalo Bill that you want 50% on the dollar of everything. Sure. And I love in the book that the quote <laughs> when he comes back to Nebraska, and you can imagine they're not fast cars. There's no planes. He had to take a carriage from Nebraska to Chicago and then back to Chicago over the course of several days to arrive <laughs> and tell Buffalo Bill they're going to take 50% of his profits. And he quote says, 50%? Who do these SOBs think they are? <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. So in the gauziest move of the novel, Buffalo Bill moving straight up to Chicago, taking his whole band with him and leasing 15 acres right across from the World's Fair and saying, now we're going to set the camp right here. <laughs> so you're having your World's Fair on the 630 acres. We're going to take this little 15 acre spot and make camp a month before your fair starts and start making money. Like that was absolutely genius. I love it. So him coming up on March 20th with 100 cavalry troopers, 46 cowboys, 97 Cheyenne Sioux Indians, 53 Cossacks and Hussars, Russian and European military men, and hundreds of animals, buffalo and elk, and just showing up with Annie Oakley and saying, here we are, <laughs> and we're ready to have a show. And I love it. And so he opened four weeks before the exposition, and my favorite story from the novel that it talks about is when they had Waves Day. So Buffalo Bill approaching the mayor at the time saying, can we have a day where kids can come for free to, my, to the fair, to the exposition? And they're like, no, we need the money. And him saying, okay, fine. And it's genius marketing. It's such a great marketing move on Buffalo Bill's part because he's going, okay, we'll have waste day and we're going to let every child come in free. We're going to have all the candy and ice cream that they want mm -hmm. and they can see the show at no charge. And in that one day alone, they had 15,000 kids come to visit his exposition. And that kind of hailed him as champion of the, of the poor, described by people as that, and then from then it just cemented his show being successful. So, and the book talks about this to an extent, but during his engagement, he would have, on average, 16,000 spectators for each performance that he did. 16,000 for 318 performances he did during the run of the World's Fair. And so by the time it was all said and done, he cleared a million dollars in 1893 in profit, which is 30 million today. And I love that kind of the opposite of Ferris, Buffalo Bill's story of what he did afterwards was taking that money and founding Cody, Wyoming, which is his namesake town, founding that town, um, building extensive fairgrounds in North Platte, Nebraska, um, retiring the debts of five Nebraska churches that he was affiliated with, and then the rest of the balance went towards keeping his business going. So I thought that was extremely impressive what he did with, with that profit. And then the best part of the book says he did it entirely without giving Burnham a single cent. So kind of just him taking that entire ruse of trying to be cashed out for the, for the project and just turning it on its head. So uh, as far as inspirations, this is probably another part of the book that I found so fascinating was just everything that originated from the World's Fair that I hadn't even considered. So the Pledge of Allegiance was first said at the World's Fair, mm -hmm. only it was a little bit different. It was, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So it was a little tweaked from, from now. But the idea of that, the fact that the people that were at the World's Fair, so Harry Houdini and his brother roaming the streets of the Midway doing magic acts that nobody would even know who these guys were in 1893. The idea of, um, when I mentioned the White City, Frank L. Baum, who wrote Wizard of Oz a few years later, that based the entire Emerald City off of the White City, so just changing the color of that. Um, foods, not only the brownie by Bertha Palmer, but shredded wheat, 
uh, diet soda, perhaps blue ribbon, Aunt Jemima syrup, pancake mix, Wrigley's gum, all of that being part of the exhibitions that were at the World's Fair for the first time for people to see. And then the idea of electricity being a thing, because you know we, we take so much advantage of electricity that we have now, but the fact that this was the first time it was really on display for the public, the fact that you have an all electronic kitchen, the fact that they use electricity to light the fair at night, the fact that they had the electric companies come in and have all these technology and improvements there was really interesting. And then of course, the part that I, I like reading the novel, just kind of put my book down, was like, oh, is the fact that Elias Disney was one of the construction workers on the World's Fair. And then his son, Walt Disney, would go on to create Disney World later on and kind of take inspiration from the World's Fair. And you can see it in all the architecture and design. All that inspiration is there. If you've ever been to Disney World, you can just see it. And that's so fascinating that it's just, I, I'm a big person for like linear history, and like dots connecting and threads like going out in history, and that's just so neat. And then um, I did actually cry reading this part of the book where it was Helen Keller going up and showing the man that created Braille and shaking his hand and thanking him. And that was just, that was so touching to see that part of the book where the man that created Braille meeting one of the most famous people in American history at the, and then Ann Sullivan being at that exhibit with her. So. <laughs> so that was the World's Fair in all of its glory. And I love that this book does a wonderful job of contrasting the magic and optimism and positivity that comes out of diversity with the World's Fair and contrast that with Holmes. Because it's the World's Fair portion of these books with all the architects and everything seems so expansive and broad. And then you cut back and forth to the part with Holmes and it seems so claustrophobic and seems so small and intimate and dark. And I really, really appreciated that. So honestly, in reading the book, I did not picture Holmes to look like that. <laughs> but again, I'm not picturing 1893 men with mustaches and bowler hats. But, um, but that's a picture of Holmes up there in the corner described as having very, very blue eyes. And originally, Henry Webster Mudgett, who renamed himself Dr. Holmes. And his entire portion of this book is so, I don't know if you all felt this too, but I felt like if this had happened in modern times, there have been so many times he'd been caught. Like right off the bat, I'm like, well, you're trying to do this fraud. You're trying to get these life insurance policies. Like all of this just seems like in modern times, you would have caught him right off the bat. But the fact that it was 1800s and we didn't have the resources we do now, and the fact that we don't have cell phones or things to trace, because there's no GPS. The detective guy can't go out and trace where these things happen. You're just dealing with letters and trying to find things on horseback. It's, it's a totally different scenario. But I also find the fact that he was only sentenced to death for the murder of his partner, Ben, being kind of a travesty because he was confessed to so many murders. It was just his partner that is the one that he was kind of hung for. But I wanted to include that picture of the hotel because I was trying to imagine in my head what the hotel looked like in the book. Because it was kind of genius on Holmes's part, the way that he constructed the hotel and that he'd just hire contractors on to do little bits and pieces and then he'd fire them because they started guessing too much. They started to say, oh, this doesn't make sense. Why do you have a chute leading down to a basement? Why do you have a vault? Why do you have doors that don't go anywhere? Why do you have hallways that don't lead to anywhere? And so him just firing contractors and hiring new ones so they wouldn't question things was genius on his part, but also incredibly disturbing. And it leans to the, the house itself, the hotel just looks kind of odd. It doesn't look right. It looks like someone did just build it in pieces and put it together. It kind of looks like a patchwork. But the idea of it being this 100 room hotel that had the stores and shops on the bottom floor and then the top two floors had your living quarters it just has a very sinister look to it. And it's all location, 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 because it was all right there by the World's Fair. So it was cheap, it was enticing to young women, it was enticing to go to because <coughs> Holmes was a very attentive, attractive man. So Holmes himself, uh, dealing with more than 50 lawsuits from Chicago, uh, mostly for fraud, things like that. Um, interesting to note about his, it was recently in the news actually, and that was right before coming here, I read an article a few days ago where they just found out that um, his great-great-grandson, uh, he's an American lawyer, Jeff Mudgett, recently came out saying that he's eight cousins with Meghan Markle. <laughs> so, so they had a whole article about Holmes and Meghan Markle, and they're like, so she's related to H.H. H. Holmes. I'm like, of course she is. And so, <laughs> and, but in, I was, the article made me 
made me kind of frustrated because having read the book, they were like, oh, well, is Holmes Jack the Ripper? And I'm like, no, he's not. The timeline doesn't match up. No. <laughs> it's like, no, he's not been to Europe. He couldn't have been there at the same time. No. <laughs> and in the in the article, the Jeff Mudges guy like, I don't know, maybe. And I'm like, no, read the book. <laughs> like, he's your family. You should know this. No. Um, I, Holmes is so fascinating because not, his upbringing is very stereotypical. If you've read any type of crime thriller, the whole idea of what we now know as stereotypical red flags for people that would be serial killers. Like the idea that as a kid, he wasn't freaked out by seeing the skeleton in the doctor's office. That the kids tried to scare him and he didn't, wasn't affected. The idea that he dissected animals as a child was very disturbing. And the idea that he was very, very fascinated with death and then went on to, you know, become a, went to the school of medicine and surgery. But, um, the line from his prison cell that he wrote in his memoir, and the fact that he was kind of an egotist and wanted people to read his story, he was very obsessed with attention. But the idea, when talking about going to the doctor's office and seeing the skeleton, he wrote from his prison cell, it was a wicked and dangerous thing to do to a child of tender years in health, but a crude and heroic method of treatment, destined ultimately to cure me of my fears, to inculcate in me first a strong feeling of curiosity, and later a desire to learn which resulted years afterwards in my adopting medicine as a profession. It's like, ugh. And then you hear what he does in the book, and you're like, that's just very cold and bone-chilling how clinical he is about all of that. But um, I found it interesting that the two wives that he had children with were completely spared. Nothing happened to them. The fact that Clara stayed in New Hampshire with his son, and he just made up excuses to, as to why he never came back from Chicago, but he left them alone. And then also the fact that with his other wife and his daughter Lucy, he just moved them to the other side of town and left them. And nothing happened. Throughout the whole book, I kept thinking he was going to go back and try to do something. But he never did, which I wondered if that was because... And then we get to the story of the Connors with Julia and Ned. And I wondered if he, that's why he killed Julia, because he didn't, if he had a child, maybe he didn't want to hurt them if it was his own kid, because none of his children would be harmed. So I found that very interesting with Holmes. Um, going back in here, he was convicted, he confessed to 27 murders in the book, but they, the police and detectives believe that it was much more than that, that they can't quite pin on him because as they find him in a hotel, and that part of the book is quite disturbing when they find the basement and see the remains and the acid vats that they find, that they can't identify people. Like that's just absolutely awful. But definitely um, Julia Connor, the wife of Ned, who she had an affair with, um, Pearl Connor, they found. Um, the Sigrand, Emmeline Sigrand, her part of the story was absolutely horrific. The idea of the vault with the footprint on the door, and they think that that's where she had he'd put acid on the floor to keep her from leaving, and that she tried to push open the door with her foot and it left a footprint just embedded on it. Is that part that part sticks out to me most in all because it's just so visceral and and dark, and the fact that no one can explain it. And then obviously Minnie and Anna Williams taking their Texas inheritance from them by convincing them to come up and see them. And then obviously his business partner and then the three children, which is quite disturbing. And so, and that the Pietzel children getting dire involved with the entire investigation. So the idea that at one point he was married to three different women, and we think now, there's no way with Facebook or social media, you couldn't hide that. <laughs> you couldn't have social media and get away with that. But the fact that he was such a manipulator and was so good at writing letters to people and, and covering his tracks and saying, oh, well, no, they went to Europe. They're in Europe right now. And when you think about it, it would take you weeks to write a letter to Europe, get back correspondence. So by the time you've done that, he's three steps ahead and already planning out what he's going to do next. So in the context of the time that the story took place, it makes sense how he was able to get away with it because he was just really good at covering his tracks to a point. And then finally, it all kind of comes crashing down on him once he goes to Philadelphia. But the idea that he stayed in Chicago as long as he could, and it's actually because of the World's Fair that I believe he ends up getting caught. Because after the World's Fair is over, the economy in Chicago suffers a major blip. It reminds me a lot of modern times. There's been articles I've read where people build like giant soccer stadiums in like other countries, and then once you know the Olympics are over, then the town's like, okay, we have this $60 million soccer stadium. What do we do? It's just going to sit there and nobody's going to use it. And that's kind of history repeating itself with the World's Fair. After the World's Fair was over, why were people going to Chicago? What were we going to do? 
And so because of that, Holmes realizes I need to get out now because now all the investors that were swept up with the World's Fair are like, okay, World's Fair over, where's your money? And he's like, so he leaves with Pietzel. And they move to Texas, they try to start another hotel, it doesn't fare successfully, he gets caught in a fraud act, gets put to jail, he manipulates a man to help him get out of jail, and then ends up taking Pietzel to Philadelphia, and that's where he tells him to take out a life insurance policy, which as last month's book review tells you, you probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> if someone tells you to take out a life insurance policy, that's red flag number one. You should probably be like, I need to get away from this person. But he does, and then fakes his death, which we find out um, was not faked. And then um, the part with the children is probably the most sad because the one daughter writing letters to her mother that he was keeping and not mailing is probably one of the saddest parts of the book. But that's Geyer's whole point in discovering what ends up happening there. And so, yeah, again, mirroring the sports stadium. Uh, George Georgiana Yoke, she's an interesting character. I know that there's a book that she's that's been written about her that's about being a witness because she traveled with him for a while to Texas and then nothing really happened to her. Um, she kind of just bailed on him once he was arrested. But then the whole idea of about um, Holmes convincing he had sold to kind of fake his death and then ending up going with that. And I, I felt sympathetic towards Geyer because when we're introduced to Geyer the detective, he's coming across losing his wife and child. And so he has a connection to this case, and I found that really interesting that it's kind of Dyer's motivation in finding these kids. He's like, well, I know what it's like for a parent to lose a child, and so he wants to help carry Getzel find her children, and it just ends horribly tragic when he actually does find out what happened to them. And there were a few times where I kind of just closed the book and just sat down and went, mm -hmm. just very disturbing to think that someone was capable of doing what he did, and the entire time either denying it or just acting like it wasn't a thing. Just acting completely calm around it. It's probably the most disturbing part that up until his death, there's a, a photo, I didn't include it in the slideshow, but there's a photo that someone's, an artist has drawn rendering when he was hung, and he's standing there still trying to talk to somebody. Like, it's just no big thing. Like, I'm just sitting here on the gallows about to be hung, but hey, I want to tell you a story. Like, it's just an absolute sociopath. And so, it's very, very interesting. And then they finally, what, what amazes me, and I don't know if you all thought this too, is that it took them forever to investigate the castle, to investigate the hotel. It took them forever once this case started getting notoriety and people in America were like checking their newspapers each week, like being like, oh, is Guy going to find a new clue or something? Then the authorities in Chicago finally decided to be like, maybe we should check out this murder castle that everyone's talking about. And then finally taking it apart and finding out everything. Um, I didn't talk about it in the presentation here, but another fact of kind of signifying the end of the World's Fair was the assassination of the mayor. And so the whole Pendergast storyline was kind of put in there too. And I don't know if you all, but I feel like I wanted more of Pendergast in this book. He was kind of the, the angry, angry Irishman that wanted to be noticed and then the mayor was not paying attention to him and so finally he just kind of snapped. Like I felt like he was weaved into the story, but they didn't quite get to him until the very end when the assassination of the mayor happens. It's kind of in the fair there, but... And then, yeah, I upstairs, one of the workers from the library was talking about, they're like, oh, people said there wasn't enough thriller parts in this book. I'm like, I think there was enough. <laughs> I think there was, I think um, going into the story, if you expect it to all be about homes, it can be a little disruptive to go back and forth. But I, I liked that in the book because it gets heavy with Holmes' part. And so I needed that kind of break to say, okay, let's go back to the happy ex let's go back to the world square and the underdog story where they're trying to make everything work and it's, it's going all right, and then we'll get back to Holmes. Because Holmes' side is, there's not really a happy ending to Holmes' story at all. Every character ends up either negatively affected, even Geyer kind of becomes more and more disheartened the more the deeper he gets into that case. But, but yeah, overall, I mean, as far as the story goes, I, it's probably one of the only nonfiction books I've read multiple times and found each time I go back and read it, and there was not enough time, like, like Crystal said, we could do a two hour whole thing where we just break down the book entirely, but it's one of those books that every time I read it, you were talking about going to the beach, I went on vacation a few weeks ago and I took this book with me to reread it, and so I reread it over two days, I was just sitting there, because once you got into it, you just kept wanting to go on and see what was gonna happen next. And it does have good places where you can kind of stop and pause and then go back to it. But, so I'm curious, you know, do you all have questions or thoughts? Or? I was thinking about the cost 
of getting into the World's Fair, 50 cents, that was probably a day's wages. Mm -hmm. And you know, a professional now would earn $300 a day. So if you uh, counteracted those amounts, it was not cheap to get in for 50 cents. Mm -hmm. No, and, and the, fact that, the fact that people went back. Yes. And Yes. Yeah, that they went back to the fair and spent a day's wages just to go back, and that wasn't even the food or anything else. It was just right. the Ferris wheel, was just to get in. And I, I couldn't quite understand the beginning until I thought, like you said, when you think about how much it costs. At the beginning, they were worried that people weren't coming to the fair, and that it was taking so many months to build up attendance. And they're like, well, and everybody was kind of thinking, and I don't blame them. They're like, well, we don't want to go until the Ferris wheel's done and all the exhibits are there. Why would we spend our money now when it's not all completed? Mm -hmm. And that part was kind of nerve-wracking because reading it the first time, I'm like, oh, well, what are they going to do? <laughs> well, money was a, a very big part of this venture in the first place. And the fact that he got that much money and people on board with it, especially that, that part where Olmstead looks over Jackson Park and sees nothing, and he's like, hmm. <laughs> like, okay, we're going we're gonna to do this. Like, yeah, how they convince people, like, the, the stars aligned in some way to make it all work out. And it hasn't been that long since the poverty of the Civil War, either. Right. Yeah, and the fact they did this, you know, less than 30 years since then, that's not enough time to build up, you know, they, and they were talking about the economy throughout this book and how there was all, like, bank runs and things happening where the banks were failing and money people, I can't imagine the news at that time of being like, oh yeah, go to this World's Fair. And then on the other side of the page, it's like, there's no money. And then you're like, oh, huh. Sounds like a modern day Disney. Yes. Like how expensive it is to go to Disney and well, buy a ticket. People go for multiple days and they take their kids I, and it ends up being such a fortune. About that. They go for two or three days at a time or maybe longer and they have to save for months to get the, the money to go. Yeah, it's very interesting, the whole part about Elias Disney being inspired and telling his son about it. I'm like, I can't, it, the model's so reminiscent of it. It's just, yeah, like history repeating itself. It's fascinating. Yeah. What have you read about a um, television or movie? <sighs> oh, yes. So I, I did read that Leonardo DiCaprio bought the rights to this back in 2019. And him and Martin Scorsese were originally going to make a movie, but then they now decided to do a TV series. But I think a TV series is a much better idea because there's there's too much. I mean, you can't adapt 500 pages of a book with all this dense history into a movie. So I I I read about that this year, and I got really excited. So I was like, ooh, and I wondered if Leonardo DiCaprio was gonna. Of course, he wants to star in it. <laughs> I was like, will he be burned? I'm just, I don't know. I thought that would be interesting, but I would. Absolutely love to see them adapt it. And that, I think it's, there's a lot of trends right now of, I think of Peaky Blinders, a series that have like kind of that noir 1900s, 1920s vibe to it. There's a lot of series like that on now. And I could see it just fitting into that niche of, and it's all true stuff. So that would be, you don't have to be fictional with it. It's, you can just do it based <laughs> off the real thing and it's engaging enough, especially the aspect of Holmes, definitely. But yeah, I was really excited about that. And then I read the Mary Marvel thing, I was like, oh, <laughs> it's like, no. <laughs> well, thank you so much. No. That was great. Thank you all for